there is hope, and uh, one, one hope is what's, there's lots of hope, uh, eventually we'll wake up, what will cause us to wake up. Um, finance is leaving the banks. So the, the, the other part of regulation, the, the no competition, is, uh, is part of what happened with banks. There hasn't been a single new bank chartered in the last 15 years, as far as I know. Uh, but what happens to old, not very competitive industries? People innovate around them. So already, uh, home loan originations, courtesy of our colleague Amit Seru, home loan originations have left bank and gone off to fintech companies. And payments is, is there are new uh, payment systems that are being innovated around uh, banks. Now, sometimes innovation around, when you're innovating around bad regulations, uh, sometimes that's the free market, the, the, the weeds of the free market growing and, and uh, turning into wonderful things. Sometimes a lot of the financial innovation in 2008 was around bad regulations and made the financial system less stable. So this can be both good and bad, but that is the, the weeds are growing in finance. And there is, I think, one sign of hope, at, at least, if, uh, if things go okay. I, uh, so what do we need to do, bottom line? Tear it down and start, start from scratch. Uh, financial institutions that make risky loans have to get their money by issuing something like equity that doesn't cause runs. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Patching it is not gonna work. Um, so sooner or later, and I think, now you may say, you ought to say, you're, you're being way too polite. This is politically infeasible. Uh, and I think that's exactly right. It is politically infeasible. Well, one thing, by the way, banks love the current system. It, under the current system, so the regulations have given the banks a barrier to entry. No one can come in and start a new bank because it takes hundreds of millions of dollars to set up a compliance department with all the regulations. So they've, they've made their peace with it. Uh, there's a barrier to entry and competition, and they know that if they get in trouble, the government's gonna bail, out, uh, bail them out because they're systemically important. So, so they kind of like the current system. That's the difficulty if some of you will go to Washington and you will say something like this and someone will say, but that's politically infeasible. And I want to encourage us not to shut up just because something is politically infeasible. It's the only answer. The only thing that's actually gonna work is going back to something simple like that. If nobody ever says, here's the ideal thing, if nobody ever says, here's the ideal thing, how will we ever get to the ideal thing? If all anybody ever does is say, well, that's politically infeasible, so we won't talk about it. Instead, we'll just talk about how to change the mark-to-market requirements on how you book swap contracts in a subsidiary, blah, blah, blah. Well, then no one's ever gonna get to the ideal thing. So I think it is important for us to, to remember, here's Nirvana. Okay, now we'll do something that's politically feasible for the moment. But what's politically feasible one day changes uh, the next day, uh, and uh, things can change quickly. So, so don't uh, give up on condition. Did you want to say something? I just wanted to say, can you sketch out a specific set of policies that you could imagine in some constellation having a politically feasible path? Because, you know, we're not going to get rid of deposit insurance. That's there. So you've got to basically order banks to issue equity. You know? And, and how's that gonna, how is that going to happen? Well, de deposit insurance is actually real, not that much of a problem. But you can simply carve up the bank, the deposits. The banks are holding trillions of dollars of reserves right now. So really, we, we are at narrow banking nirvana. You just have to separate in bankruptcy the short-term debt that's flowing into reserves and treasuries and the other assets that are flowing into risky assets. If you just separate those guys out into bankruptcy, you're done. So it, it's not that hard. Or uh, my other favorite idea... Um, you could also get the leverage out of the banks. Suppose that the bank on the left issued only equity. And then there's a second, you, a second institution, let's call it a holding company, whose assets are bank equity and whose liabilities are all the current stuff. Well, just imagine, let, let's suppose that this loses money. Uh, suppose you have an institution whose assets are traded bank equity on the markets and whose liabilities are its own equity and deposits. And it needs to get resolved in bankruptcy. We do that in five minutes. Right? The equity capital gets nothing, long-term debt gets a write-down, short the deposits are paid off. You, what you don't do is you don't mix in bankruptcy all of the skill that knows how to make that stuff 
uh, and, and then tear it apart over a period of two years. Um, this is a question of how we get from here to there. What is the bill that, that our students can introduce? My favorite would be a, um, so the regulators will use market values of equity and debt, and we put in a tax on short-term debt. So uh, we, we, we tend to have cliffs. On this side of the cliff is safe, on that side of the cliff is dangerous. That's a terrible idea. I, I would put in just a steady, and you know, when you become treasury secretary, I'll come work for you, and we, we could actually do this. You can put in just a steady fee. The larger the fraction of short-term debt in your portfolio, every, every short-term bond you issue, you're gonna pay five, five cents a year on, on the short-term debt. If you really think it's important to issue short-term debt, fine, pay the tax. Uh, and as you are less and less leveraged, we're also gonna lighten up on regulations. So if you're 60% equity, the bank examiners are never coming by, do whatever the hell you want. So I think, I think those incentives, it wouldn't cure the existing big banks, but we also have to allow new banks to enter, which the Fed does not do. The Fed won't let narrow banks come in. Okay, let's do it. Yes, go ahead. Um, I don't know, but Mike, but are we seeing some of this already with like private credit um, coming in and like making a lot of loans to small and medium businesses? Like Toma Bravo just did a sixteen billion dollar takeover with no bank loans. Um, so are we sort of seeing the the market solve a little bit of this? Absolutely. So fintech is coming in and is making all sorts of loans and other investments that banks won't do anymore, and banks won't do them in part for regulatory reasons. Uh, um, we're kind of in, in the world of the, the way the current capital regulations work really discourage banks from taking even uh, normal risks. So what happens? It goes off to FinTech. Now, here there's, there is a worry. If the FinTech uh, finances itself by issuing equity, great, Nirvana takes over. But there's a, ten, a temptation for the FinTech companies, and where are they gonna get the money to make the loans? Well, why don't they just issue one week commercial paper uh, to, to make the loans? Now we have reinvented the 19th century bank and we're ready to explode again. Uh, so there is, you need some regulation because there is an incentive to do this. There's an incentive to, to issue deposits and make risky loans. And if things go south, you just say, well, banks closed today. Oh, also keep tickets to Brazil on your top, uh, in, in the, top uh, drawer of your desk, because you might be needing them someday. Uh, so that incentive is there. You need some way of stopping that, that externality. So that's, FinTech could come in and, and solve our problems. And, and maybe what Josh and I will do is we'll write, reforming old institutions is always a terrible idea, but writing ways that new institutions could come in, that's the unexploited opportunity. So we'll, we'll let's, Let's write regulations for fintech companies to come in, issue lots and lots of equity, be very lightly regulated, and go for it, guys. And they can just drive the dinosaurs out of business. You don't have to, everybody says, how do we fix the banks? How do we fix the health insurance companies? How do we fix the hospitals? Don't let new ones come in. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, my name is Neil. I'm from the University of Chicago. Mm. Um, I'm going to ask so a question we. about you know, <laughs> banking system. I'm signed up for a course with Harold Ulick called Money and Banking. Um, so forgive me if I you know, make a mistake here. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to talk about it with more intelligence in three months' time. But um, That's why we're here. You know, my, my understanding is that you know, in the central bank relies on the money multiplier to kind of guarantee that you know, its, uh, its activities will actually get propagated and um, you know their their money creation will propagate throughout the economy, and what it seems like here is if you're if you're um, you know only making loans not based on deposits but on equity that you issue, uh, the money multiplier would be severely crimped. Um, but you know, will my is my understanding wrong? I guess first of all, and uh, if it's not wrong, then kind of how does this kind of play into um, your proposed regulations? Your your understanding is great, and uh, let me warn you about studying monetary economics. Um, about the same time when the little old lady in the fly par uh, fable was invented, about 1965, similarly, a, a fairy tale was invented about how banks work. And in fact, it's how banks worked back then. And uh, for everybody else, so the way the system works is um, the banks have reserves at the Fed, 
and then they issue deposits against those reserves, and there's more of these guys than those guys, basically. So if the Fed increases the amount of reserves, then the, the total amount of deposits, which sort of count as money in circulation, goes up. And then the idea is that more of those deposits stimulates economic activity, MV equals PY on Milton Friedman's license plate through this multiplier mechanism. Uh, and that's a nice fable of 1965 that applies zero today, even though you will still read about it in every... They, they ought to just retitle the monetary economics books History of Monetary Economics, because they were written at a time when... So when I was very, very young, if you wanted to go out to dinner on Saturday night, you had to go to the bank on Friday, write a check, and get cash. And if you did not have cash, you go to the restaurant and, and you don't get any food. Now, you might say, let them use credit cards like Marie Antoinette did. There were no credit cards. So money really mattered back then. Now, money doesn't matter at all in that sense. You can just use a credit card if you need to. So the link between holding cash and deposits and economic activity disappeared 20 years ago. And the link between reserves and the... So the money supply doesn't matter anymore. Uh, the reserves um, now are perfect substitutes for treasury bonds because they both pay, in pay interest. So, so this old idea of I'm going to give you more reserves and take away treasury bonds is like I'm going to give you red M&Ms and take away green M&Ms and think that's going to fix your diet. But there, we, have, we used to have 10 billion of return reserves. Now there are, I forgot, what are we up to? Josh, like 8 trillion, 9 trillion? I forgot what reserves are up to, but it's just... So that's 10 billion versus 8,000 trillion. Uh, 8,000 billion, right. The reserves thing is, and we're just a wash in reserves. We're, we're in that portion where um, people are holding reserves as a savings vehicle, not as a transactions vehicle. So it was a lovely story. It was a great fable. Uh, like many things, much of your economics training will be you are told fairy stories from the past. So you'll be told, told the money demand, money supply, money multiplier, fairy story has nothing to do with today. You will be told the uh, standard oil is a natural monopoly needs regulation fairy story. has nothing to do with even scholarship about how standard oil works. You'll be told lots of fairy stories. But let's not get off of the other ones. Yeah.